Investigative journalist Andy Ngo covers one of the most dangerous stories of our time, Antifa. The extreme leftist movement has been terrorizing his hometown of Portland for over a year. And Andy is almost alone in his work exposing their inner workings, their goals and tactics. This has made him Antifa enemy number one. In 2019, he was severely beaten by them, resulting in a brain hemorrhage. Since then, Antifa has consistently threatened Andy's life. Then, two weeks ago, he was attacked again. There's a very disturbing clip you can watch on Andy's Twitter feed. At the end of his ordeal that night, he escaped into a hotel. And outside, an aggressive mob is screaming and pounding on the hotel door, yelling many expletives and saying, we're coming for you. They sent out tweets tracking him. Andy No is at the Nines Hotel right now. And Andy No out via the service exit on Adler, according to Cop Radio. And they explicitly called for his death. Don't worry about martyrs being created from cancel culture. Andy No needs to go one way or another. We have back on the show with us one of the bravest journalists out there and author, Andy No. Andy, I know you're still recovering, so thank you very much for taking the time to come on today. Uh, honestly, I was, I was really disturbed by what happened to you, especially hearing and seeing the video of your attackers with so much hate and aggression towards you. Can you explain how you got into that situation on May 28th? Yeah, so um, I've, you've interviewed me before when I uh, was in the UK for um, late last year. I left the US, left Portland. Um, I had already been on borrowed time, actually. There's been attempts to um, continue to intimidate me ever since the beating two years ago. But the reporting that I do is important, and it does require firsthand field observations and um, if even possible, even doing interviews. Um, there's a lot of risk in all that. Um, the book had uh, unmasked came out in February this year. That was the result of being on the ground uh, for the past two years. But uh, I had been gone for six months and um, I needed to see how their tactics and strategies have changed in 2021 compared to last year. The riots are still ongoing in Portland, not as intense or frequent, but they're still happening and the consequences are still being felt. And so I was out on the ground on the 28th of May uh, in disguise, um, marching along with them. And towards the end of the night, um, for whatever reason, they became suspicious. Uh, I believe it probably has to do with the fact that I wasn't engaged in any criminal activities, unlike some of the other comrades. And um, they interrogated me and uh, pulled off my mask and, mask and goggles and saw my face and shouted, uh, that's him, that's him, get him. So I was pursued through downtown Portland. I was running in the middle of the roads um, where there were people and cars and trying to flag down help while sprinting for my life. Uh, nobody helped. It was really a bystander effect, uh, understandably in some ways. There is so much dysfunction in downtown Portland with people having mental health crises all the time that seeing somebody screaming and running down the middle of the street and stopping traffic isn't actually really that unusual. Um, unfortunately, one of the people in the mall that were pursuing me uh, tackled me to the ground and started um, hitting my face and head. And um, in, in those moments when I was pinned down, I could hear the rest of them all pursuing. And I, I knew if they got me, they would uh, kill me. They had already been promising that for uh, two years at this point. Uh, the person who pinned me down got distracted by two journalists with cameras out who were photographing or videoing. And I was able to crawl forward and uh, take off running again and that's when I ran into the hotel and um, ran, uh, took the elevator to a different floor because there was a mob outside trying to break in and um, uh, I was uh, escorted out through a, di uh, a discreet uh, exit in the back. Um, there were SWAT police, dozens of them in the front trying to restore order because of how violent this mob was and how angry they were and uh, I was taken by ambulance to hospital. And, um... Wow, so 
there were journalists recording all of this, but nobody helped you? No, and they only, re uh, one of them released a couple either stills or screenshots, photos. Uh, not, neither one of them have released video. Uh, and um, that's really disappointing, not surprising though. Um, I mean, if you, uh, these are journalists who follow the rules of Antifa, and that means not releasing any videos or images that could um, help victims of crime uh, when Antifa is a perpetrator. Those are rules, by the way, that I'm not willing to abide by. Um, I, it is my right to observe and document things that are happening in the public space. And um, they've tried to use violence and intimidation against me in the past. And uh, I don't give up because when you do that, that's a precedent that they win, that they can claim ownership over the public space and say which journalists are allowed to be there and what you are allowed to do and not do and that's not something that i'm okay with it, it's very impressive and it's one of the reasons i wanted to have you on today because despite what happens you've been relentless you're you're tweeting every day you're trying to expose their tactics the perpetrators how are you able to do that <laughs> Um, I think I I do it because right now there's nobody yet to pass the baton onto, and um, I wrote about other things. I reported about other things before, and if I have other interests, of course. As of right now, I I don't see anybody who's ready to to take on to do what I'm doing. So um, I feel there's a responsibility for me to continue because I. Re I love the I love the United States. I love uh, the country that my that gave my parents asylum uh, and a home, a uh, home for me, and the opportunities I have. And I think that um, it's my my duty and responsibility to continue to inform the the public about the true nature of Antifa. And I look forward to the day, hopefully, that I, that I don't just pass it on the baton to one person, but many many journalists. I think. What particularly makes me such a lightning target for Antifa is that um, there's very, very few um, doing what I do. In fact, I, you know, you can count on one hand if that. So, um, unfortunately, journalists at the local level recognize how dangerous it is to cover this, so they just stay away and or they follow the rules of Antifa and never challenge the their power or the status quo. Um, so, you know, there needs to be uh, journalists and institutions are willing to um, support this because, you know, doing independent reporting on Antifa is, um, one, it's really dangerous, but two, like you need the institutional corporate backing of something larger behind it, right? So, like for me, um, I couldn't find any private professional security over the past two years who were willing to take me on as a client because they did their own risk assessment and saw all the threats against me and all that. So that's one reason why I didn't have, you know, a whole team of security. Two, um, you can't really do your work covering Antifa if you have six men around you following your every move. Uh, three, sending in stringers or other people uh, to do things uh, for me um, also puts them at uh, really severe risk. So, you know, none of these options are really good. And in the end, I made the decision that uh, I did on the 28th of May, which is I was going to go undercover, as I've done before. Every time I did it in the past was a risk. And um, unfortunately, that day, um, I was severely injured uh, for it. Um, that that is uh, the cost of do, doing this type of coverage in America. I think that is what's um, particularly damning about this whole thing. It's not just you know the instance of violence against me, but what it says about um, press freedom in the U.S. and and where the real threat is coming from that nobody's talking about. Yeah, that is the um, the sad part of the the sad side of the story, or another sad side. But tell me, has I, I feel like maybe the pressure is working? I don't know. You can tell me. There is uh, five members of Congress have sent a letter to Attorney General uh, Merrick Garland to try to 
get something done on your behalf or and other journalists who have been attacked. There was, you just reported that there was about uh, how many, over two dozen Antifa were uh, charged recently for the violence. Is that an impact from your reporting and are you seeing some positive signs of greater support? Um, I think I could take the optimistic view. Um, you know, politicians have uh, vocalized support for me before, uh, and uh, I really appreciate what these con uh, congressmen uh, are doing in writing to the Attorney General. But, you know, I'm also reminded that in the previous administration, when we had at the, the very top level, you know, in the form of Donald Trump, being vocally um, uh, in opposition to Antifa and calling them out for being domestic terrorists, that didn't lead to um, the type of all hands on deck that you, you would think uh, would happen if, um, invest, uh, if federal investigators were actually um, taking the threat seriously. So uh, I'm, I'm reminded of that. And the arrests that have happened in the past two weeks are uh, independent of my assault. It, it's more so that um, the district attorney in, in Multnomah County or Portland is the, the one who has been letting out as a matter of policy, uh, dropping the cases of uh, more than 90% of the rioters uh, since last year. I think he's feeling the pressure now because as much as Portland is a political monoculture who tolerates far less extremism, there is a line, I think, that has been crossed by uh, 12 months of destruction to the economic corridor of downtown Portland. And so he's feeling pressured to at least um, do some token uh, charges. So, you know, I mean, I mean, but I'm not going to complain in that regard, you know, I mean, some indictments are better than none. So, but you, you have a really large problem and nobody's addressing the root issue, which is that these are organized criminal groups and no one's actually breaking up the groups they're just um they're going after the easy ones who are committing the the arson and the violence and the vandalism but they're not going after those who are actually more wise and cover up the tracks much better got it all right well we're out of time thank you so much and and do take care thank you